here we go. Thank you very much. Hi. Okay, so as just said, uh, turn your phones up as loud as possible, interrupt really often. Uh, no. Uh, okay, hello everybody. Thank you very much for coming along here. Let's see if the clicker actually works. It does. Excellent stuff. Uh, so my name is Professor Matter Haggis. Uh, I have been making games for quite a while now. I started off um, with things like Burnout Paradise uh, quite a few years ago in AAA side of things. I was one of the writers on Aliens vs. Predator. Uh, I've also done lots of indie stuff before that, so I've been doing about 15 years. I had a couple of series on uh, MTV2 in Europe. I've done animations and games for Channel 4 and things like that, back in my indie freelance days. Uh, these days I'm actually Associate Professor at NHTV University in the Netherlands. It's one of the highest rated games courses in Europe, so if you're looking at games education, really great place to go. Some of my students in the room. Hi, students. Um, I'm also making a game at the moment called Fragments of Him. It's coming out on Xbox One and PC next month and later in the year on PlayStation 4, which is really, really storytelling focused. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today is a lot of the storytelling and writing methods that I've used when I'm making Fragments of Him, using illustrations from classic literature and things like that. You may have also noticed that I do talk really quite fast. Uh, so I know we've got an international audience here, so not everybody can always keep up if I go really, really fast and I talk like that. So um, the most of the big important points are going to be on screens be behind me. There's a lot of them. So what I'm going to do to make this easy is I'm going to be building up a, uh, a diagram as we go today. Do want to reassure you, the very, very last slide after I said thank you and all that kind of stuff, I will put the full diagram up on screen, so you don't need to be constantly photographing if you think you're going to miss this diagram. It will be all there at the end. You will have time to take it if you want to. Hopefully you find it interesting enough to want to take it. So let's build up this diagram. This is the, the kind of the core part of it. We're going to roughly build it out this kind of way that we start off with the before you even start writing like this, why you would write like this, what actually writing like this is, and what I mean when we go after writing like this. I want to say by like this is like, how do we write less? Or how do we write the same amount but say more? How do we kind of keep the compression but increase the complexity? This is really what we're looking at here. Now, there's three different methods I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, a lot of this is keying in with a lot of the other narrative design talks you may have heard over the last couple of days. There's a lot of, a lot of things that a lot of people are talking about in trying to build complexity in here. Okay, so we've got these three techniques which are going to feed into that central one there. So the very first part, I want to emphasize this before you even start doing this, is don't compromise essential gameplay information. It is really important the player needs to be able to understand what they're doing, how they're supposed to be achieving these things. With that in mind, now you can start playing around with your writing. So keep it obvious, unless it's part of the game for people to not know, but I'll leave it up to you to understand that. So really what we're aiming for here is adding value with story. We want the stories to make the experiences more engaging, the play more fun, the world more immersive. Because really, what story is there for is additional investment into the play activities. Now those play activities might be shooting a robot in the face, they might be saving a cat from a tree. But why is it a robot? Why is it a cat? If these things have emotional attachment in them already, how do we build on that emotional attachment? How do we make those actions feel more meaningful? And this is really what we're looking here, uh, trying to achieve. We're trying to make meaning within our games. Because basically we've got this situation where we've got all our players on one side, and we've got our game that we've made here, and sometimes it kind of feels like story is this wall in the middle between the two of them. That you've got these cutscenes you have to watch, you have to listen to this dialogue, you kind of go, yep. Okay, when, when does this story end? When can I actually move on to the next piece? That's not the world we want to be working in. We want to be working this kind of way where the game is right next to them all the time, they're fully engaged with this. Um, and then that kind of play experience is becoming something which is involved with it. All the storytelling is involved with that play experience on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. It's building out into more complex experiences, and the whole story is interwoven into the game. So this is what we're really looking for. To get to this point, we need what we call active listening, where the story becomes something that they're involved with. They're not just going, oh yeah, more words being spoken. They're going, ah, these words are interesting. This makes my actions more compelling. This makes the world more interesting uh, to play with. So we want people to read between the lines. We want people to be interpreting what's going on there. What are the characters thinking is obviously one of the big questions here. Uh, are they lying to themselves? Or are they trying to lie to others? These are really big questions which you can play with in your dialogue without having to add extra kind of gameplay mechanics and extra parts in there. 
Basically, this idea of interpretation is a form of engagement. Storytelling doesn't have to be this passive thing. It's a form of engagement when people are trying to understand and trying to get into the heads of, of the characters. So, let's keep on going here. The first technique I'm going to talk about is omissions in the text. If we want to move on with from this, we've got a couple of characters going to be helping us today. We've got uh, Tess and Gemma. There they are. There, meet Tess and Gemma. We're going to be visiting them a few times. Tess and Gemma are in a motel. Very nice for them. Uh, except the motel is surrounded by zombies. Uh, and so this is fairly classic gameplay situation. Got a couple of people hold up. There's guns and there's things to shoot at. We obviously want to have some good dialogue involved with all this, this kind of stuff. Well, I think we've really got kind of three options of how we want to go about this in terms of storytelling. Now, one of the options is that we don't actually really do storytelling here. We just go, okay, bring the zombies through the doors, through the windows, start shooting them, and that's absolutely fine. If you want to go for a con completely mechanics-driven kind of game, go for it. I'm not insisting you need to have cutscenes or storytelling and stuff like that. If you want to make that game, go for it. But today we're going to be talking more about the writing side of things and how we do this. So option two is what people go for most of the time, probably a fairly standard dialogue interchange. So let's look at sort of one of the things we might have here. Perhaps Tess is going to say something like, do you think we'll make it through till dawn? And Gemma might come back with, I don't know, but we'll try. Okay. And it's, it, it's all right, it's fine. That's that standard dialogue for a video game. That's kind of how we would expect to hear a lot of these things. But this is, this is kind of quintessentially really passive listening. There's, no, there's nothing for you to really interrogate what's going on inside their minds. They've just told you everything. And really, that's just building a wall. That's just a few lines of dialogue which are standing between you and the game on the other side. And so you want your player to be more involved with that. You want to have it a little bit more engaging. So we need to look at this third option that we have available for us. So let's go on to this point where I'm talking about this. Let's go on to the omissions here. Now, when I, when I say omissions, I mean that we are leaving out words or information from the text, from the dialogue that's going on there. I'm going to give you an example of how this kind of stuff can work. Shakespeare's King Lear. This is one of my favorite plays ever written. It's one of the greatest tragedies in history. This is an amazing, amazing play. If you don't know it, I highly recommend reading it. Starts off with the king. There he is. Um, these are my, my brilliant sketches. Thank you. Um, and the King Lear has three daughters. And to roughly paraphrase Shakespeare, it starts off with him going something like, tell me how much you love me and you'll all get a third of my stuff. Roughly like that. Um, and of course, Mine stuff. I don't know. Um, and of course, you get two of the daughters, Goner and Reagan, who come back with this kind of response of, well, we love you more than anything. We love you more than stars, the moon, our husbands can all go screw themselves. Uh, it's really this kind of uh, over the top, overblown, just pouring these words of love out to him. And the king's like, awesome. I feel very nice now. You feel, now you feel like a very good king. Excellent. And then we get to Cordelia's turn. Cordelia is the youngest. Cordelia truly loves King Lear. True, she truly, truly loves him. And that's a wonderful thing. And the audience understands this. She has a little aside to the audience going, how the hell am I supposed to say that? After what they've said, whatever I say is going to sound wrong. And so we have the king say, what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. If my slide changes every week. Oh, slow computers. Don't you just love it when they do that? Excellent. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond. No more, nor less. This is wonderful. She's saying, basically, at some point, I'm going to get married. And I'm going to love my husband probably more than I love you. I'm going to have children. I'm going to love them absolutely dearly. And all of them will have a portion of my love. I cannot say I love you alone because there are so many people in my life that I'm going to love. This is a difficult situation for her, and the king doesn't get it. You've had these other two sisters going, everything is you, and then one comes back and goes, I can't pour my heart out like that. And the audience understands Cordelia's struggle. They understand that it's difficult, but, but Lear does not until it's way, way too late. I mean, this is a difficult position. How can you express the inexpressible? Love beyond words. How do you even talk about love? 
I mean, Shakespeare himself, could, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? This whole sonnet is about how it's almost impossible to really quantify what love is. And this is one of the greatest writers in history of language. Amazing, amazing words. And he's, he even says, God, I can't really do it. So one of the ways we can do this is kind of by using contrast, for example. So we've got the contrast between uh, the first two sisters and what they say, and the true love that Cordelia feels, which is almost inexpressible. And the audience then has to kind of fill in the difference. The audience begins to understand the difference between these two things. What did King Lear hear compared to what Cordelia said? When she said nothing, what did the king hear on the other end of that? And that's really engaging, because as an audience, we're always second-guessing where we're going to end up here. Quick note, I want to say, if you're writing like this for your actors, please, please don't forget them. They are people who need to understand what the hell is going on with your dialogue when you're leaving things out here. So tell them what's left unsaid within your script uh, when you leave a line unfinished. Those little ellipses that you might love putting at the end of your lines, don't forget to fill the actor in. It's actually what's been missed out there. Otherwise, they're going to get lost, and you might get a terrible performance in the audio booth. So do remember your actors when you're doing this kind of stuff. Also, I want to sort of mention that implication is another form of omission. The idea where you're implying lots of ideas. This is an example used yesterday. That's my excellent picture of Leia from uh, Star Wars there. Uh, and she, she, she says, I love you to Han, and Han is kind of being smug. Uh, and he, he, he kind of comes back with, I know. Uh, you almost feel like there should be a tink of the light from his teeth when he says that. Uh, it's a bit cheesy, but the implication of what's said there is actually much more powerful than if he just said, I love you too, which was in the script. That whole breadth of their experience of, of Leia going, I'm going to go to the end of the galaxy to find you. I will save you no matter what happens here. I'm going to tell you I love you, even though this is embarrassing almost to say in front of every single other person. It's the worst possible time to say it. I'm going to declare my love for you right now. And Han goes... There's no way I can ever come back from that. I really understand that you absolutely mean everything that you've just said. Im the implication of that. I know. So much is put into those little words. I think it's fantastic. It's really nice writing. So let's go back to Tess and Gemma. Let's look at their kind of uh, discussion here. Do you think we'll make it through to dawn? I... We'll try. Now, that's, that's nicer, I think. I mean, you've got to fill in what's going on there. She, she hesitates, unsure, but then sounds determined. And of course, don't forget your actors. I don't know is the implication there. So make sure everything's there for people. Now, if we compare that to the first version, whereas I don't know, but we'll try, I've only taken out a few words, but it changes the meaning. It changes the feel of that sentence a lot. There's more emotions in there. We've kind of doubled up on the amount of emotional content without really expanding a lot of what's being said in the amount of time. I think that's nicer writing. So, that was kind of our main option three there. That was uh, using emissions. Uh, so let's go back to our original diagram. And we're going to fill that in over the side there. Any second now. There we go. Awesome. Cool. So let's go on to the second option we've got available for us. This is apparent non sequiturs. Now, you may know uh, non sequiturs. Non sequiturs are awesome, often used in comedy and stuff like that. Why did the, cr why did the chicken cross the road? Fish. Um, that's a non sequitur joke. It makes no sense because it's a sudden change of tone or subject. Now, what I'm talking about really is apparent non sequiturs. So, although it seems like there's no reason for it to suddenly change, it actually is. There's a deeper dialogue going on underneath there. And the non sequitur is a way of, sort of demonstrating what that dialogue is. I saw a piece in X Files recently where Mulder was sitting there going, oh, yes, the killer did this kind of stuff. And Scully just goes, yeah, I'm not sure how long my mother's going to make it. Complete break in tone of subject, and it completely reveals without this big kind of conversation of like, oh, that's very interesting, we shouldn't think about that, but I'm more interested in my mother at this moment. You don't need this link between it. Just that contrast is actually sometimes a more powerful way than trying to push these things together. I think there's a nice example here in uh, Girl Interrupted. Susanna Kaysen writes this. It was a spring day, the sort that gives people hope. All soft winds and delicate smells of warm earth. Suicide weather. Tone is established, and then that tone is disrupted, violently breaking this, making a powerful portrait of the character's internal state. This is really, really powerful writing, and it's really short writing. I mean, she could have taken pages to try and write that same kind of break there, that same kind of emotional experience. But just doing that with a couple of lines, very, very powerful stuff. Very powerful. Another one we've got from uh, a little bit more lighthearted is uh, Waiting for Godot, Samuel Beckett. Lovely, lovely bit of work. Also mentioned so far in the... the, the uh, conference. Uh, 
Estragon chewing, I ask you a question. Vladimir, ah. Estragon, did you reply? Vladimir, how's the carrot? Estragon, it's a carrot. Lovely. I love Samuel Beckett. It's really just weird stuff. But it's, it's, it's got a lot going on in there. It's got this kind of comic, tragic kind of thing to it that you're asking questions that didn't probably get answered the first time. And if it did, they've forgotten what that answer was. And there's this kind of loss of communication going on here. They're stuck in this meaningless loop of trying to find out the answer and not really knowing what the question was in the first place. And that's basically the entire play summarized in two lines of writing. That is really efficient writing a whole play in two lines. I think that is brilliant. That's the power that you can have if you use this technique correctly. However, with great power comes great responsibility. It's the warning time. Hooray. So there you are, your brilliant genius writer with your brilliant, brilliant uh, non-secretary in your script. This is awesome. And then you go to your producer and your producer goes, no, I don't think so. No, no. So a lot of people think that really, really direct writing is the only way to go for games. This is the only way to write. It's like the really most obvious possible thing you could do. Uh, I don't really agree with that. I think uh, apparent non-secretaries are really, really indirect. These are possibly the least direct way of doing something possible. But they're so powerful. Um, you're going to get a lot of arguments about this. I mean, every technique from this session I'm talking about today, it is indirect writing. It's giving story without saying absolutely what's in the mind of the people. It's more powerful for that. It uses their imagination. But it's going to trigger a lot of debates, and I think this one is going to trigger the most debates out of a lot of them. I think it's worth it. I think it's a really powerful technique if you can get it right. Once again, don't mess with gameplay information, but if you get this right, it's a really great insight to characters. Let's go back to Tess and Gemma. So, do you think we'll make it through till dawn, says Tess. And Gemma comes back with, I... Don't forget your coat. It looks like rain in the morning. That's kind of nice. I like this one. Sounds unsure to begin with. Then she pauses for a moment. She looks out the window at the sky above the crowd of zombies, and in a conversational tone, it's clearly covering some fear. She says, don't forget your coat. It looks like rain in the morning. When everything else is going on, that's the thing she says instead. So if we compare this to the other options that we had, we started off with that one down the bottom there. I don't know, but we'll try. And that's fine. That's, that's, that's resolved. It's very determined. That's, that's great. And if we go to the, to the next one, it's scared, but it's resolved. We've kind of doubled up on our emotional content, so we're doing good work here. And this third one, well, we've got fear. We've got a little bit of bravado. It doesn't matter. I don't care about the zombies. There's this determination of, yeah, of course we'll make it. There's a little bit of humor in there. There's a little bit of fear in there. It's all these things mixed together. And something that I think is really, really, really important to games, even games about shooting zombies in the face, it's got a bit of love in there. These people care about each other. They, they care about... Gemma cares that, that, that Tess actually feels okay. And she's put on a brave face for her friend, or her companion, or her partner. It's... I think this is a much more powerful way of writing, and I think there's a lot more complexity with a similar length line as what we started from. I think that's the power of writing like this, and I think it's really worth looking into. So, let's go back here. Let's add that onto the, the bottom part there. So we've got a change in tone of subject. It's disjunction really reveals the internal dialogues. It's great for complexity, it's great for being brief, and it really gets right to the point without these overall links of going this to this to this to this to new subject. It's a way of skipping out all that stuff and smooshing them together and sometimes getting a much more powerful effect because of that. Okay, so the third one I want to talk to you about is unreliable narrators. Um, I've got two major kind of parts that I'm going to talk about here. The first one's actually really quite small. Um, so I'm going to divide them up here. The first one's quite small on the left-hand side here, which is honest mistakes. Um, fairly quick one. I'll just give you a quick example of that. The next section, the big section really here, is deception. And within deception, I'm actually going to split that up into two pieces as well. I'm going to talk about deception, which is lying to yourself, self-deception. I'm going to talk a little bit about ungrounded realities. I think they're both quite important. Uh, and I've got the sort of the last one, which is the most obvious one, which is lying to people, deceiving others. Okay, so let's start ourselves off with honest mistakes to begin with. Um, as I mentioned at the start, I'm making a game called Fragments of Him. 
in Fragments of Him, there's many stories told, and one of them is from the perspective of Sarah. There's my awesome drawing of Sarah. Tino, if you're watching this, sorry, your artwork's much better than mine. Um, Sarah has a memory of, of her, her time going on a date with a character called Will. They went to a cinema. Now, the player actually has a choice of where to sit in this cinema. They've got to sit in the middle, front, middle, or back. Now, that's weird, if this is a memory. Because, uh, I mean, how can there be a player choice if it's just a memory? There's always going to be kind of one right choice, uh, and the others are going to be wrong choices. Isn't that right? That feels like that should be correct. Or it's just an honest mistake. Maybe she did sit at the front and we chose sitting at the middle. That's okay. But whatever she goes with, yeah, that's, that's fine. We'll just keep on going with that. Because which seat was chosen doesn't actually matter to Sarah. That bit's irrelevant. It's like saying, well, the person shot me with a gun which was red or blue. It doesn't matter whether the gun was red or blue. What matters was you got shot by it. And you're pretty sure, certain about the being shot bit. So you can understand the priorities of the characters by giving some uncertainty in other parts of this. So where we sat, player choice, um, that's kind of fuzzy. It's not important to Sarah. But what happened when she sat down there, that's certain, that's very important. And so you get these ideas of priorities and what matters most to the character inside their own head. So those little simple mistakes, they're tricky to use in your scripts, tricky to use in your dialogue, because it can seem like, ah, it's a clue, it's a clue, they made a mistake, they said this, but it was really that. So be really careful using these. Um, they can fit in there, they can complement things. But this is why I just said this was one of the smaller sections. Basically, active listeners are rewarded for, with character insight from the contrast between the certainty and the fuzziness. And they kind of go, oh, so they didn't care about that, but this that they're really certain of. It, intuitively, using this kind of really emotional driven thinking, they understand intuitively that's the bit that matters. And I think that's a nice thing, is getting people good character insight just with a couple of lines of dialogue. So let's move on to the next section there, self-deception, lying to yourself, and ungrounded realities. So one of my favorite games of all time is a game called Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. Uh, I think it's a brilliant piece of level design. Uh, combat's a little bit... Yeah. Puzzle design is absolutely brilliant, but the storytelling it is genius. It is so, so nicely done. If you've not played it, I highly recommend it. Uh, it starts out with a very talented, a very petulant prince who thinks he's awesome, he's going to go steal this thing, and he's going to do the thing over there, and he's going to save the day, and going to invade the city. And he's kind of really full of himself. He really is quite full of himself. Uh, like a lot of game characters, to be honest. From now on, I trust no one but myself. It's one of the things he says to himself at the start of this. It's okay, you know, um, it, it's fine. But to be honest, as uh, the prince is lying to himself constantly at the start of this. And as people listening, we're kind of going, yeah, that's not going to stay that way for the whole story, is it? And we're all sitting there knowing this. We know he's lying to himself. And it's helping us feel smarter. We are actively engaged in going, nope, that's not true. Nope, you can keep saying that, Prince, but it's still not going to be true, no matter how many times you say it to yourself. And isn't that lovely that we're listening to dialogue and engaging with it? It's interactive dialogue. Without choices, without branching structures, it's interactive just by the nature of interpretation of dialogue. That's the power of good writing. And the player can enjoy anticipating the prince's self-discovery towards the end of it. That's gameplay. His self-deception adds to the fun of the game. The writing adds to the experience. And that's what we all want to do with our writing. And the player's work is repaid. By the end of the game, he's saying, come with me, please. He fills the meaning of love. He needs companionship. He recognizes there is a world outside himself. Brilliant character growth demonstrated with really nice kind of part of self-deception. And then that kind of veil falling away as the story goes on. Mary Shelley also used this in Frankenstein, this kind of stuff, that so we get a slightly different version of this, of kind of ungrounded realities here. So every aspect of the story is framed but for, for us. We never really see the truth. There's no kind of authorial sort of structure sitting outside there, omnisciently looking down and going, this is the story. Because we've got this version of reality. Now, reality exists outside of this, but reality is actually framed by a character called Wal Robert Walton, who is writing Frankenstein, the story Frankenstein, to his sister in a series of letters. The thing is, Robert Walton is actually writing what he was told by Victor Frankenstein. So we've got Robert Walton interpreting Victor Frankenstein's letters when he's writing to his sister. The thing is, Victor Frankenstein is actually sometimes telling Robert Walton what he was told by the monster. And so we've got all these different layers coming in here. And for all we know, Robert Walton just thought his sister was a bit ill and she might fancy a, fa a cool story. It could all be lies. And we never know. We never know where the true reality of this is. The reality gets squished and squished and squished until it might all be true, but we really don't know. 
And I think that's really a really powerful kind of way of doing it. We only really see through the reality that they see. And I think that's a really interesting thing because we're always questioning what that is. This is used in a lot of other things. Uh, so things like movies like Fight Club. Uh, American Psycho, of course, is a big one. Um, hello. Thank you. Uh, we've got other games, of course. We've got things like uh, Eternal Darkness. A uh, really great game. You sort of see the world through the eyes of the characters. And you're never quite sure entirely what is real there. Uh, Grand Theft Auto V, Trevor's Hallucinations. It's very clearly signposted. You're seeing the world through Trevor's eyes. You don't think that all the gang members have got dog heads all of a sudden in the game. Um, Spec Ops The Line, of course. That's a whole game which plays with the unreliable narrator. It's a brilliant, brilliant experience. If you've not seen the talk from GDC in 2012, look it up on GDC Vault. It's a really, really great talk about Spec Ops The Line. Brilliant, brilliant story about that one. Uh, and of course, Batman. Um, I'm a really, really big fan of what was done with Batman Arkham Knight. I think this is fantastic. Because really, in reality, the Joker is dead. There is, there is no doubt about this. There is, there's no question really what's going on here. But the thing is, Batman's reality isn't quite that one. He's slightly moved sideways from reality in this game. Um, we only see the world through Batman's eyes. And in that reality, the Joker isn't quite dead. I think that's really interesting. As a player, we can kind of think about this. It's very, very engaging to try and understand what's going on in these. What is actually real in Batman's world? What's a hallucination? Is any of it real? And also, does it even matter? And that's a really nice question as well. It's like, is this a hallucination? Is that person who we think it is? Are they not? Am I attacking the wrong person here? What's going on? I think that's a really, really nice kind of dialogue for your players to engage with in that game. So that's that one. Uh, that's about kind of self-deception and the ungrounded realities when you're stepping away from what is really true. Looking now at uh, deceiving others, lying. Uh, I like Emily, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. That's a nice example of this one. But again, we've got a couple of framing narratives going on here. We've got Nelly, who's talking to Lockwood, who's then recording his version of it. Uh, and there's a sense that Nelly might be kind of embellishing her story. She seems to enjoy telling this story. She seems to enjoy making it a bit more interesting. And there's a sense that maybe she's adding some stuff in, but why is she adding this stuff in? Is she bored? Is she looking for attention? Is, is she frustrated with her life? Why is she adding this stuff in? And what is she actually adding? There are scenes where it seems like it would be really weird for Nellie to have been there, but she says she was. But also, maybe there's stuff being taken away. So what do we see? What don't we see? What does this tell us actually about her as a character? Because the speaker is unintentionally revealing them true selves by the lies that they tell and the things that they make up. And I think that's a really nice way of playing this. We see what concerns them. We see what they're trying to hide by the lies that they create. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, of course, this is, this is a great thing. I mean, questioning what is real is a really active kind of listening mechanic. It's, it's a great way of playing with these. It really rewards players who think about reality outside the frame of the game that's being presented to them. They kind of go, this is the reality of Batman. This is the reality of Nelly. This is the reality of Lockwood or Victor Frankenstein. What's going on outside there? What is the true reality beyond that? Thinking outside that frame is a really, really powerful thing for your, for your players to do and a really great way of engaging them. So, that was our three options there. And let's go back and have... Oh, yes, I, let's have a warning again. Because, of course, I mean, what, everything, everything I'm saying here, this is awesome, lie to your players. I'm just telling you to lie to your players, whoops. Um, inspire your characters to question uh, the reality that they're in. Players need clues, though, to begin speculating that not all is as it seems. This is a really, really important part. Don't forget to let people come in on this one. Um, because you don't always have to be subtle about this either. You just need to make sure people understand what's going on here. So, for example, Batman Arkham Knight. This is not very subtle in telling us what's going on here. It starts with the Joker's cremation. You literally press a button and set the Joker on fire in a coffin. Um, the Joker is very, very definitely dead at this point. He's not coming out of this one. Uh, but Bat still sees the Joker. This is really, really a big clue that the reality is quite subjective in this game because he's still seeing him, still seeing this person who we know is dead. So, give clues to what's going on here. Um, or it's just unintelligible lies, and that doesn't add anything. If people can't tell there's lies, people can't tell there's deception, they're not going to be actively questioning that. Right, so let's add that last little part to there, and we're going to have one quick more section down at the end there, which is going a little bit further this into clues. Clues are a really simple kind of part here. 
Guide players with well-written dialogue, but if possible, for the best results, go beyond script. So there are many, many tools that you can use for storytelling in games. You've got how the world looks, environmental art, environmental storytelling, of course. How lines are spoken, acting, don't forget your actors, tell them how to do this stuff. How characters move, the animation, get your animation team on board with the story. Interactions, interface, what can the player do, how does the player know how they're supposed to do it. All of these things are ways you can tell your story. And of course, please, please, please don't forget your audio team. They are really, really important in telling your story. And also, I would also say, just don't forget your marketing team. There's actually a lot of storytelling you can do outside your game to give hints, to give clues. So um, alternate reality games, books, trailers, there's ways of giving clues about your story outside of the game as well. So please get them involved with that kind of side of it. So just going through this very quickly at the end here, that's going beyond script, so we've added the last part in. So just to summarize this, and there will be a final screen where all this is nice high resolution in a moment for you, before you get your cameras out, thank you. Uh, don't compromise. Uh, add value with the story, because that's really our goal here. Look for active listening. This is really what we're trying to achieve here. Leave some words out sometimes. That could be a way of adding a bit more depth, a bit more complexity. Changing tone in subject and quick, quite quickly can be a really powerful way of creating a sense of internal dialogue going on there. Unreliable narrators are framing reality in their own way. The player has to question what that reality truly is. And in the end of it, once you've achieved all these things, think about going beyond script. Find out other ways to support this. And one really, really important question, which I'm sure you're all dying to know, is that Tess and Gemma did survive until dawn. Uh, that's obviously very, very important. They didn't need their coat because it didn't rain. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope this talk's really inspired you for active listening uh, in your audience. Well, thank you. <laughs> Sometimes you can say more by saying nothing. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Thank you. Don't forget to fill in the feedback. And as promised, there you go. <laughs> Boom, that is so many cameras. Wow, awesome. <laughs> Thank you for listening, everybody.